continuing in our sermon series on 2 Thessalonians, where we're simply working through this uh, whole book passage by passage to see what Paul has for us, and more specifically, to see what God has for us in this text. And today we are going to be talking about this man of lawlessness. Now, unfortunately, we cannot do justice to this passage or to this topic in a single sermon, but we're going to try to hit the main points of the man of lawlessness today. And in, in order to, uh, for two purposes, and specifically, we're going to be following the purposes of Paul in this passage. The purposes of Paul in this passage is specifically, number one, to comfort and edify the people of God, and number two, to correct false teaching. Those are Paul's two main points, and so those are the points that we'll be trying to get across as we work through this passage. Now, there are a few ground rules for playing with that I just want to simply go over with because we're going to be going and in, entering into something called eschatology. It's a fancy $10 word. It means um, study of the end times. Now, here's the thing. I don't subscribe to any particular end time system. And so many people who we hear have, may have undertaken study of the end times. It is one of the more popular studies to kind of do because it's so intriguing to talk about. You may have a specific uh, thought pattern or theology of what the end times is going to be like. Um, I may step on your toes a bit today if you have that mindset. And that's going to be okay. I might challenge you a bit. On the other side of the coin, I may end up supporting something you believe. Just because I do so, just because I challenge you in one area or support you in another area, please don't feel or think that I'm a fan of a particular system. Which brings us to point number two of the ground rules when we're looking at this text. Smile real big. What I care about is what the text says and what the text allows for, not for any speculation, right? And so we're going to try to minimize and limit speculation, and we're going to be very honest. Here's what the text says, and here's what the text allows for, which can be a, quite a bit more than we would actually like for the text to allow for. And so we're going to be, we'll be going both over those things. Um, third, here's another big point. If you happen to believe like I do that the United States is in a bit of trouble right now as people are walking away from the Lord and as churches are being fled and abandoned, right? If you happen to believe that, don't mistake, don't make this mistake of combining the decline of a nation in the end times. Right. Just because a nation may be declining from a certain perspective does not necessitate that we are in the end times. Okay. On the contrary, just because you may think a nation is doing very well, it does not mean that we are not in the end times. Smile. We're going to make it through. All right. So just want to make some of these things clear and concise for us and, and have some lines of thinking to help us think about this passage. Fourth, and I want to emphasize this again, and I cannot emphasize it enough. In this passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as well as in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, where he talks about the end times as well, in neither place is he looking to lay out a detailed system of the end times. His main purpose is to encourage the body. And the second is actually to, and specifically here, to correct false teaching. Which means since we're working through 2 Thessalonians, there's going to be a lot of questions that you may have. Paul may or may not answer them. That's okay. All right? So now let's go ahead and dive into the text. First, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. What is... Paul's concern for the Thessalonians. What is he driving at? Look, he's going to lay out a topic. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. This is something he addressed in his first letter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and on to the end of the chapter, as well as in chapter 5, all the way down, I think, to somewhere around chapter uh, verse 12. 
He's talking about the coming of the Lord, but he's doing it from a very, very positive perspective in 1 Thessalonians. He says, this is what it's going to be like when the Lord Jesus returns, and here's going to be the resurrection of the dead. This is what's happening. However, something has happened in the, Th in, in the Thessalonica church to confuse them. Look here in verse 2. Not, uh, we have, backing up into verse 1, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. We're going to skip the next portion just for the moment. To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Which means what? The Thessalonians are worried and concerned. They are, in fact, alarmed that the day of the Lord already happened. And Paul's kind of shrugging his shoulders in the letter and going, I don't know how you got that from what was said before, or even if it was from me, and we don't know what was going on. Okay? It could be misinformation. It could be a false teaching. It could be that they misinterpreted what he said in the first Thessalonians. We don't necessarily know, because Paul doesn't necessarily know. He just knows they're off track and they actually believed that the day of the Lord had already happened. Now that's trouble. And look at what, they're, what, what state they're in. They're shaken in mind or alarmed. F.F. F. Bruce in his comment on his word biblical commentary here translates it like this. Do not be quickly shaken out of your wits or disturbed. It's a fine translation. Don't be, don't, don't go crazy, is what he's saying. Number one, don't, don't be upset. Don't be disturbed about such a false teaching. And look, he labels three areas in which it might have happened. Now, when we go over these three areas, just because something happened to set the Thessalonica church off course does not mean that these three things are bad or are not supposed to be in the church. Again, we need to draw really careful lines. Look at this. Verse 2. Not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. Okay? Three things he's attributing it to. Any one of them could be possible. When he says a spirit, what he really kind of is, is pointing at or poking at is some sort of revelation by prophecy that was not of the Holy Spirit, right? That's why it's a spirit, a revelation by prophecy in the church that the day of the Lord had already come. Paul's saying, nope, that's false. Now again, remember that it doesn't mean it's not supposed to be in the church. It means that that particular spirit or that particular prophecy was wrong. Look here, number two, a spoken word. Um, the translators are working really hard to translate this well. Just to, if you want to just write in pencil above that, what it means is a teaching. It means a sermon. It means, it means somebody got up and taught something, right? And obviously that's not bad. It just happened that if there was a false teaching in the church, it needs to be corrected. Number three, or a letter seeming to be from us, right? So uh, an idea that there might have been a false letter forged. Somebody might have brought something in in order to distract or distort the church, and again, what's in regard of? To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So there's the issue. They're in need of encouragement. What's the second issue? There's some sort of false teaching happening in the church. And Paul is going to work to correct this. Let's move into verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, meaning the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Here's where we get into some really fascinating things. It's absolutely fascinating. Here we go. Ready? The word rebellion. It's the Greek word apostasia. And you might already hear, oh, okay, that sounds like something familiar. In English, we get the word apostasy from it. Apostasy. Now, here's the thing. In wider Greek, that word can mean a political rebellion. It means a rebellion against a government or an authority in the government. But in the New Testament, it's almost always used as either a rebellion against God 
or a desertion of the faith, right? Deserting the faith, leaving the course of Christianity, leaving following Jesus. So then the question comes, well, so is the rebellion going to be something regarding a political government? You know, Paul's mind would have been the Roman Empire. Or does it mean that there's going to be some sort of rebellion against a government in the world? Uh, huh? Does it mean that it could be, um, and this would have been a specifically Jewish thought, would it have been um, Jews abandoning the law of Moses? Probably not. Sorry to put a damper on that one. Probably not. Could it be that the church becomes apostate and that there's a rebellion against God in the church? Could be. Now, here's the thing. We have to take in mind the context. The context is a word of comfort, not trying to scare the Thessalonians out of their minds, right? The Thessalonians out of their minds. Here's the comfort. True believers will never leave Jesus. Jesus has them. It does not mean every person in the church is a true believer. So it can both be true at once. Well, that's part of the ambiguity of the text. We just don't know. But there's going to be some sort of rebellion. Now, here's the thing. The rebellion is going to be something against God. And this is really important. It is, it, it's a, against either an authority that God put into the government or it's literally a rebellion against God. My, my take on this is probably it's going to be a rebellion against God because it helps us to make sense of this next thing. Look at this. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, capture that word revealed or whatever it is in your translation. It's really important that something um, like revealed in there. So if it's not there, write it in your margins. We're going to hang on to that until a little bit later in the sermon. What does it mean for the man of lawlessness? What does it mean to be a man of lawlessness? Some translations may say man of sin. That's a fine translation too. And gets in that the idea that this rebellion is against God. The man of lawlessness is going to be someone who rebels against all the ways of God, all of the laws of God. Now capture this. Just because it's a rebellion against God and God's ways does not mean it won't be completely legal according to human standards. Smile. Lawlessness does not mean a lack of legality. This figure can be doing everything that he wants to do in the entire world, or in the entire, and he'll do it all legally. You, you can bet your money on that. The trick will be to see if it's against God's ways or not. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Well, what's the subtitle here? The son of destruction. What does it mean that he's the son of destruction? Well, here's the thing. Um, and Gordon Fee, in his New International Commentary on the New Testament on Galatians, will put it this way, and it's really clear. As elsewhere in the New Testament, the language son of is a Hebraism, meaning a Hebrew idiom, for one who shares in or stands in close relationship to someone or something. So son of destruction means that he's, he's right there. He identifies with he's part of destruction. Now other translations may say um, perdition. Perdition is a fine translation. It means hell. He's a son of hell. He's a child of hell. And the idea is not that he will be a destroyer, although we can probably presume he's going to destroy some stuff. The idea is that he is going to be destroyed himself, specifically by being thrown into hell. Right? So he's the man of lawlessness. And as we're thinking about the man of lawlessness, Paul is immediately associating this figure, this antichrist figure with hell with losing, with defeat, with destruction. But he continues his description. Look in verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself against 
every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. There's actually a lot baked in here for this figure. When he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God. It means this person is going to be, how do I put this politely? I'm not going to put it politely. I'm just going to say it and you'll have to apologize. He's going to be so high on himself, everything else will be beneath him. Right? That's called uh, supreme arrogance. Think of, um, what's the word? It has maniac as the second part of that word. Eglomaniac? Egomaniac, thank you. He's going to be an egomaniac, right? This person is just going to be intoxicated with himself. And he's going to be against every other religion with the purpose of establishing one religion specifically around himself. That's what that text means. He's going to be about the worship of himself. Where is he going to do the worship? Look at this. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Now, most likely, I'm just going to say it, most likely, remember we're trying to avoid speculation, but I do have to say what the text says and what it allows for. Most likely what he's talking about is the temple in Jerusalem. Right? That would have been the obvious thing that would have gone to everyone's mind. This is before the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So when he's thinking the temple of God, it's most likely that temple. Which means, folks, we're not there yet in the end times, are we? Because if that temple has to be rebuilt, we're a little bit of ways away. I do say a little bit of ways away. You can do your own research on that. Now, here's what the text allows for, though. The text actually allows for any temple of God. Right? So you have what's presumed in the text, which is being the temple in Jerusalem, but the text does not specifically say in Jerusalem, and the word there in Greek could allow for any sanctuary of the Lord. Now again, we're just talking about probabilities. That's less probable, but it is still allowable in the text. Okay? So this is the figure of this Antichrist figure, the man of lawlessness. He's going to be proclaiming himself to be God. Now we're into this subject. It's interesting. It's fascinating. Hit the pause button. We realize that's what Paul does. He hits the Paul bias button. He, he goes into the future and then he pulls back and he says this. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this stuff? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Verses 5 through 7 come back to Paul's present time. And he says, hey, I already taught you all this stuff. Which means this. We can't be too confident in what Paul is talking about because all Paul is doing is highlighting what he taught in order to invoke the memories of the Thessalonians. Oh yeah, Paul said this stuff. This is what it's like. Which means what to us? We lose out on all the details. Right? We only have this, this little bit and Paul is just trying to trigger in their memories the right teaching which he already taught them. Right? And things are going to become more ambiguous in that verses 5 through 7. We're going to tackle that next week when we talk about our heavy practical application. We're going to talk about what it is, because the mystery of lawlessness and the restrainer is still in effect right now. So we need some space to talk about that and really discover what it is. And then we also need to talk about later on, we'll talk about the deception in verses 10 and 11 next week. So hold back for part two. That's going to be all next week. Take a look here. Verse 8. We're talking about the man of lawlessness. Remember, that's our focus. We're, we're, we're just discovering things about him and what the text allows for in this text. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, he used revealed twice there. 
Right? He used it once in verse 8, and he uses it once in verse 3. Put on our thinking caps and our memories. What have we gone over in past weeks, even going through the Second Thessalonians? Who also will be revealed? We'll turn back, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and look here in verse 7. And to get, grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed. So the Lord Jesus is going to be revealed, but the man of all, um, lawlessness will also be revealed. And that's all the same term in Greek. It's, it's um, all conju conjugants of a word uh, apocalypto. Okay? What it means is literally that the veil is pulled back. It means some spiritual entity is right there and is visible. This being is revealed. Now, here's the thing. If the Antichrist is revealed and Jesus is revealed, then they're both actually coming in sort of similar ways. In fact, the Antichrist is going to try to mimic Jesus as much as possible. Look at this. Let's go forward in verse 8. I'll show you a second time. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The word there for Jesus in coming is parousia, right? It means his personal presence coming. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one. Well, that's also parousia. Paul's using the same exact terminology for the Antichrist as he does for Jesus, which means the Antichrist is going to try to mimic Jesus as much as possible. Look here further in verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Well, who also came with power, authority, and signs and wonders? Well, Jesus did. Yeah, that's right. Jesus did. And so here we see this man of lawlessness to outward appearances is going to look an awful lot like Jesus. How do you tell the difference? Remember that the fruit off the tree will always show the tree. The character and substance of the person will always identify the person for who they are. All right. Here's, well, there's a second way to tell. What, what we want to tell is first is just to hit the lawless one. If he comes during our time, we need to just be prepared that we are not deceived. All right. That's the trick. Once Jesus comes, the game's over, right? Everyone's going to see Jesus coming. That one's going to be pretty obvious, okay? All right, back to verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. What's something spectacular that we can grab onto and be encouraged with in this sermon? Jesus is going to annihilate him when he comes. Smile. It's actually good news for the body of Christ and the saints. I know we're Mennonites and we're like, we, we like peace and stuff, but Jesus is going to do this, right? Amen and hallelujah. If Jesus does it, it's good. And it's going to be a one who is worthy of destruction being destroyed. Now, here's going to be an honest question. This isn't a rhetorical question. You can holler back at me. Would you like to dive down the rabbit hole a little bit with me? Sure. Anyone else on this side? Sure. All right. So we're talking about the Antichrist. We're talking about the man of lawlessness, and we're talking about how he mimics Jesus. There are some really interesting things that go on in Scripture that we're going to just draw some dots between. We don't have time all, all the time today, but super interesting things happen. So the New Testament will always describe... The Antichrist is coming as a Gentile, as a Gentile, okay, meaning a non-Jew. However, in the Bible, there's little tiny hints that this Gentile will actually claim to be from a tribe of Israel. Turn with me to Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation. Now, we're going to have some fun, all right? So, we're thinking caps are on. We're going to have fun. 
We're going to go down the rabbit trail for your own studies. Ra down the rabbit hole, not the rabbit trail. It's not a rabbit trail, it's a rabbit hole. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Now, have your thinking caps on. See if you can spot it before I tell you. Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. What happens is that um, G John is seeing um, 12,000 people from each of these tribes of Israel who are sealed and who are kind of marked off as special among the people of God. We don't have time to get there. What I want you to notice is look at the tribes of Israel here. Starting in verse 5, tribe of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin. Anybody keep up the counting with me, you'll notice that there's 12. And you're going to say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, there are two tribes missing from the list. Yes, you got it. There's two tribes missing. The big tribe that isn't there is Dan. How do we get there? Well, first, let me just say that all Ephraim is also missing from the list, but Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph. Since Joseph is there, Ephraim is covered under him, even though he's not named. Dan is missing. Why is Dan missing? Bum, bum, bum. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 49. Right? Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49 is a very epic um, prophecy and series of prophecies. In Genesis chapter 49, what you'll see is that um, Jacob, who is also named Israel, is on his deathbed. And he's going to be, quote-unquote, blessing all of his sons. Some of them don't really get blessings, you know, but he's going to be blessing his sons. Genesis chapter 49, verses 6 through 18. Listen to this. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heels so that the rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O oh Lord. Gee, thanks, Dad. What a blessing. Right? And here's the question. Where else do you see a serpent in Genesis? Genesis chapter 3. The deceiver of Adam and Eve. What happens to the serpent? While the offspring of Eve is to crush the serpent's head, what does the serpent do? Bites the heels. What is Dan going to be? A serpent, by the way, who does what? Bites the heels. So there's already going on here some weird identifications with Dan. That And folks, this is not a new interpretation. This goes all the way back to the early church fathers with Irenaeus. Uh, he's actually one of the big proponents of this. So this is not new stuff. There's already some connections between Dan and the serpent. And the writer in Revelation has him missing from the tribal list. There's one more. Head with me to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Now this one is a little obscure, so we're going to dwell here just for a few minutes going down the rabbit hole, all right? Just a few minutes. You have to pick up the context. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 22. And he says this. This is this the context here is Moses is about to go up on the mountain and die, and he blesses all the different tribes. And he says this of Dan. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's cub that leaps from Bashan. Huh. Gee, thanks, Moses. Now I'm a lion's cub. Can I be a full lion? No, he's a lion's cub. Let's draw some quick connections here. You know, in, in Scripture, there are only two tribes identified with lions. The first is the tribe of Judah. Who comes from Judah? 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, right? What do the tribe is identified with the lion? Dan. The Dan is a lion's cub. Who in the New Testament also acts like a lion? Satan. Satan. Real quick, the reference there is 1 Peter. You don't have to turn there. I'll just turn there myself and read it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Right? So we have these weird connections. Now, there's one weirder connection. Again, you have to kind of understand the context, and that's Bashan. Now, Bashan is a reference to a location in northern Israel. 2,000 years ago, in this time, so uh, you have Israel, right? Mediterranean Sea, right, right here. Mediterranean Sea, right? Have Israel. Right here. On the northern landscape of Israel, there's a mountain range, and one of the big mountains on the southern point of that range is a mountain called Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon. Okay? That region right there is called Bashan. Now, Bashan is identified in Israel thought with kind of nasty stuff. So Bashan, for example, when the tribes conquer it, is conquered, and they conquer that, and they find that the king of Og is ruler of Bashan. The king of Og is a giant. It's one of the remnants of the Nephilim, right? Genesis chapter 6. Remember, we, we're going down a rabbit hole, right? Keep on coming with me, right? Bashan. Bashan's also identified with the netherworld. It's identified with basically Sheol and Hades. It's a bad place. Now, here's the thing. If you study the conquest Joshua and Judges, specifically in Joshua, what you'll see is that the allotment of Dan is actually in southern Israel. What you find in Judges is that Dan failed to conquer Israel, and Dan travels up north, way up north, and conquers a city called Lachish, which is just south of Mount Hermon in the land of Bashan. What's also really weird is that a distinct group of Gentiles disappear at that point in time. It's almost like Dan and the Gentiles merge, and then they migrate up north into this land of Bashan. Weird, right? You're pulling out question marks? I'm going to get you one weirder. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16. Now remember... A thousand years pass before the, uh, before the Romans come and before Jesus comes. You know what happens in a thousand years? Places change their names, but they don't necessarily lose their identification. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. And when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, you know where the district of Caesarea Philippi is? It's right at the base of Mount Hermon. It's in the land of Bashan. It was renamed by the Romans. You know what happens here? Listen to this, what Jesus says. Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That majestic line where Jesus is saying, I'm attacking hell. The gates of hell will not prevail. That means he's going in, right? Because gates keep people out. So if gates don't prevail, it means Jesus is going in. Where is he at? Mount Hermon, at the base, in the district of Bashan, which is associated with what? Sheol, the grave, the netherward, hell. Jesus takes a special trip way up north just to make this pronounce it. Then what does he do? Matthew chapter 17 
And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led him up a high mountain. Remember, he's at Mount Hermon in the land of Bashan. The high mountain is most likely Mount Hermon. Leads him up a high mountain. That's the, that's the mountain that dominates the entire area. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes become white as light. Well, what's he doing? Folks, he's declaring spiritual war. Here's who I am. Where? In the region associated with hell in the netherworld. Take you one weirder, and then we'll go back to the main point. Verse 22. Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. So this is right after the transfiguration. You then have Jesus coming down the mountain, and he heals a boy with a demon. Don't miss that. That's important. Where is he? He's in Lin Bashan, associated with the netherworld and hell and Sheol, and he heals a boy with a demon. Okay? Remember, he's just declared war. Verse 22, as they were gathering to Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Well, why does Jesus know that? Well, he just declared war on the powers of darkness. What are the powers of darkness doing? Mobilizing their men for war. Where does Jesus immediately start traveling to? Jerusalem, where he dies. And then, what does he do? He defeats the powers that be through the resurrection. This is all orchestrated. But folks, get the point. The major point there was just to see this, this crazy connection with Bashan, the realm of the netherworld. What does Jesus do there? Declare war against it. Who's associated with that? The tribe of Dan which is like a lion's cub, mimicking Jesus. Folks, the man of lawlessness is going to come in such a deceptive way, and we're going we're gonna to get into this next week. The deception will be so great that any who are not believers in Jesus will be deceived, period. It will be such a close mimicry. And the text is sharing and showing us with that some of the typical images of the Antichrist that we have in like movies and the Left Behind series and other sorts of things, they don't get the half of how, how well he will imitate Jesus. They don't get the half of it. The connections that will be drawn are going to be enough to deceive anyone not rooted in Jesus. Right? Now, where is our encouragement? Folks, smile. Smile. If you believe in Jesus, you're good. Just cling to him. Why? He's going to come and destroy the Antichrist. Cling to Jesus. The second thing is, folks, not just stay confident in him, but the second part of this sermon, remember, it was comfort, but then also um, a correction of false teaching. Here's the best thing that we can do is get into the Bible and study it well in prayer. Study it well in prayer. Get to know this amazing book and series of books that God has given to us. The connections are there for us to see. Don't go Bible code on me. But there are a lot of valid connections in here to see if we can see them and study for them. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father God, we just pray that it, anything that was a distraction to somebody, we just pray that that would drift away like a cloud. Father God, we, may we see you clearly. May we hold to you dearly. And may you grow us in you. Holy Spirit, please come. In your name do we pray. Amen.